We all know the brand Telfar, but how did they become the extremely respected high fashion designer that's pushing the way we experience fashion? Telfar Clements, at around the age of 15, would design and create deconstructed clothes from t-shirts, shirts and jeans that were so popular that he was basically running as a business well before the official creation of his namesake brand. This continued for the rest of his teen years, even as he entered into Pace University in 2004, which importantly allowed him a passageway back to New York where he lived briefly in his childhood. This relocation to New York introduced him to the nightlife and music scenes of New York as a DJ and model. At the same time, he would sell his designs to friends, to a now defunct consignment store Funky Lala, and sometimes just on the street when he needed to make ends meet. Telfar Clemens was following fashion trends obsessively, and observed that long-sleeved oversized t-shirts were going to be huge. Noticing this, he bought a large supply of plain white t-shirts and deconstructed them together as his take on the trend. He showed these to a friend who was working at the now defunct Vice store in New York, who in turn liked them so much that he showed them to the store buyers, who would then make the Vice store Telfar's first stockist. So, though going was tough in the beginning, with the newfound funds from selling in the store, he officially registered his work as the brand we know today, Telfar, in 2005. This came with two decisions. The first being the logo we know today, just in an earlier iteration. The logo originally was actually designed by his school teacher who would do a monogram for each of their students, and the design resonated with Clemens at an early age, and so he took it forward as the logo for the brand. The second decision was the brand slogan. It's not for you, it's for everyone. Specifically to cement his brand as a genderless expression of fashion that everyone can partake in. With this, he made his first actual collection in 2005, it evolved his deconstructed aesthetic that he'd been producing now for the last five years. Released in 2006, his second collection was apparently much more pared down than his first collection, marrying the minimalistic aesthetic popularised at the time by Jill Sander and Alexander Wang with the deconstructed aesthetic which was popularised by Ray Calcubo and Maison Martin Margiela, the combination of which really hadn't been seen before and was incredibly fresh, certainly making him an interesting designer to watch. So much so that in 2006, he was chosen to be the next Gen Arts fresh face designer, which is kind of like the New York equivalent to the Man Collective, if you're familiar with that from either of my JW Anderson, Martine Rose or Christopher Shannon videos. So Gen Arts is essentially a platform for small artists through which they can show their work. This platform meant he could stage his first actual fashion show, Spring Summer 07, at the Lincoln Arts Center in New York. The show was a success, but it was a bit run away from him. This was his first full collection to be presented, and of course he wanted the people who had supported his business, i.e. his friends, to be able to attend the show. But it wasn't really his fashion show. It was Gen Arts's. So when it came to decisions like the guest list, he had no pull whatsoever and couldn't even get his friends invited. So effectively, he got the funding as a trade-off for any control in the presentation. Obviously, he didn't like this almost exploitative show, and decided that he would then host his own shows without funding from then on. This naturally wasn't easy. Fashion shows are notoriously expensive, hence why so many designers need funds to pay for their first shows. But he made it work hosting at venues that he could afford or that were simply free, like his first solo fashion show that was held in his friend's apartment for Autumn Winter 07. You can even see his bed pushed up against the wall on the right, which I think is very comical. However, the business wasn't really growing at this point. He continued to show collections and had a few stockists, but as the 2007 recession hit, it completely put a halt to most of his sales as his stockists just went out of business. Attempting to not let this deter him, he continued putting on shows and producing fashion films, which was a trend with designers around the period, but truthfully, these years were impossibly tough for the brand, and Clemens was considering closing doors by 2009. But in times of great depravity comes the greatest creativity. He decided to pivot his brand more into art, fine art, instead of fashion, he realised he could host an art exhibition that included his clothing for significantly cheaper than he was able to host a fashion show. This idea effectively reinvigorated his interest in fashion, which saw him create his first art fashion crossover installation in 2010 for his Spring Summer 11 collection named For Male. It was a cross between an art exhibition and a fashion exhibition with mannequins as models for the clothing, just mixed in as sculpture. 
Despite the name, the collection was not exclusively for men. Excluding the bikini briefs for women, the entire collection was still genderless, and instead the name for male was more of a play on the word for mole than anything, but it was still modelled on male mannequins and fit for a more masculine frame, just that would allow a feminine frame to fit comfortably. The collection featured collaborations with Supima for the cotton basics that were deconstructed, and with Dr. Martins for the footwear. While the pieces themselves were undoubtedly the most commercial garments he created thus far, which of course meant the collection was a hit, even scoring an interview with Dazed for further promotion. More people could relate and understand the clothing than ever before, now that it fit in a little bit more with gender segregation. Even the first show studio panel on Telfar spends 30 full minutes talking about the concept of genderless clothes and how and why it's both successful, historical, and yet completely uncommercial. I also believe it was around this time that Solange Knowles, sister of Beyonce, began to learn about the brand as well. She was the first real celebrity to get in on the brand, and from my research, it seems like it was around this time that she came to know of Telfar. So, he now commenced a new era for the brand, one that was much more mainstream and more accessible to the average person, but he didn't want to completely relinquish creativity because really, that was what his brand was known for. And ultimately, doing something different is great marketing for any brand. So for many collections, he would try to find unusual methods of presentation to create hype for the brand. For example, in 2010, he had an installation at PS1's Move event, which from what he said to Dazed, sounds a bit like he was creating for the metaverse before the metaverse was even a thing, which he did through a presentation of models wearing his underwear and socks while playing the Nintendo Wii. His Spring Summer 2012 collection was done through a projection in a retail space where attendees could immediately buy the collection off of the racks, a new concept for the time, and five years before Burberry was praised for introducing the same concept. The Spring Summer 13 collection had a complete website built along with a video and photographic presentation and even a phone app. And in Autumn Winter 13, he allowed fans to see all of the garments before the show in a video game where they could create the looks that would ultimately be used in the show. Using innovation as a marketing tactic really worked. The hype around the brand was growing, especially on social media thanks to the newest addition to the Telfar team, Babak Radboy, who was brought in from Be Down magazine to be the artistic director. Radboy's main task as artistic director was promotion. He enjoyed, much as Clemens did, to do so through unexpected methods, so when he reached out to Kmart to be a sponsor for the Telfar Autumn Winter 14 collection, it certainly was unexpected. But they agreed. As part of the collection, Kmart would become a stockist for some of the more accessible silhouetted print t-shirts from the collection, enforcing that brand ethos that Telfar is a brand for everyone. Purposefully rejecting the concept that new, smaller designers have to be exclusive and expensive in order to garner cultural distinction and thereby consumer desirability. Kmart also funded pop-up shops in which Telfar sold the collection in a setting that looked like a discount retail outlet. The set inspired Telfar to design prop pieces that would resemble a Telfar-branded supermarket just to go along with the collection. One of which you're bound to know, the Telfar shopping bags. They were inspired by the brown paper Bloomingdale shopping bags, as well as by an exploration of consumerism, which has been a key element to the Telfar brand. So to put shopping bags to the forefront, even as the backdrop to the catwalk collection was really ingenious. What they didn't realize though, is that the shopping bags would soon come to define the brand as a whole, and even be seen on major celebrities like Beyonce and Oprah, to name a few. But of course they weren't Beyonce level of success right off the bat, even if they were immediately well-liked by attendees. So, not realizing how famous these bags would soon be, the brand was still looking at interesting and creative ways to grow. And since the Kmart collection was such a success, they then decided to reach out to other large everyday brands to downmarket collaborate with. In 2015, they contacted fast food chain White Castle, just through their usual customer services line. Somehow, their call reached the vice president of the company, Jamie Richardson, who was completely on board to sponsor the Spring Summer 16 collection as a whole, and even hosted their after party. On the catwalk, the collection had a much less deconstructed aesthetic than we had previously come to know the brand Telfar for, meaning that they were able to develop on their product offering into suiting, while also keeping the logo front and center. As a whole, because the collection was of a more sleek aesthetic, it opened up the brand to a wider demographic of people. The collaboration was so triumphant. 
It began a great relationship with White Castle, which would again see incredible success in 2017, when Telfar was brought on to redesign the uniform, as well as a small capsule collection which would send profits to charity, as well as presenting his Spring Summer 17 collection in a White Castle building, with workers even serving guests the White Castle cuisine wearing the new uniform. By this point, Telfar was a really well-loved brand within the scene that not only had a unique perspective on garments, but had created a niche for themselves with the interesting marketing and downmarket collaborations, a unique brand positioning that was previously untapped, meaning his creativity was starting to be noticed by the big fashion influencers, fashion brands, and generally the fashion industry, all of which culminated in him winning the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund in 2017, which is a prize fund of $400,000 meant to be used to project a brand to the next level. And he was no dummy with the money either. The shopping bags from his Kmart collection were still easily his best-selling product, selling out each and every time they came into stock. So, after he set aside funding for his Spring Summer 19 show, he took the rest of it, which was almost the entire 400000 and invested it in bulk manufacturing as many bags as possible, but this time in more colours and more sizes. Investing his money into expanding the offering of his best-selling product was a much surer investment than any other use of the money. The bags were popular, relatively cheap to make, and because they had the giant logo on the side, served as a marketing tool. Demand for the bag exploded. It sold out instantly, and everyone in fashion wanted one. So much so that it got the nickname the Bushwick Birkin because of how desirable and yet unattainable it was. Actually, the pricing for the bag is still the same as the original, going between $180 to around $257, the amount that he earned for an evening of DJing, which he did to put himself through university, meaning that he purposefully kept the price low, even at the height of its popularity, to allow everyone to afford it, perfectly manifesting the brand ethos. The only real issue with this level of hype has been the way the media related to his brand. It was often reduced to being quote-unquote diverse or labelled as streetwear, i.e. the brand was unequally critiqued because of Telfar's race, something that Clemens obviously dislikes, and it's actually the reason I did not want to tell the story of his childhood in this video, because it's told in almost every piece of media I used to research for this video, and it's kind of irrelevant because it has nothing to do with his design style or even where his influence comes from. The repetitive reduction of his brand by the media is very uncomfortable and is easily tokenism used to minimise his talent and unique point of view, like Michael Kors but on purpose, causing this tokenism to look almost like white saviourism. Despite the way the media relates to the brand, Telfar is extremely popular. It's being seen on major celebrities, it's having spots on TV shows, it's selling out so quickly that it crashes his website each and every time there is a drip. Basically, the world went mad for these affordable bags. Because of this extreme demand and high visibility, despite the low price point of the bag, it managed to keep an air of luxury to it. The bags, as an entry point to the label, worked incredibly successfully. Because of the extreme consumer desirability for the bag, by proxy, the apparel also became desirable, meaning he was also selling his fashion pieces to the masses in droves and avoided any loss of credibility, which is sometimes an undesired effect of having an entry point product, especially for a small brand. As a company, Telfar was making a huge profit of $2 million in 2019, a 200% increase on the previous year, which also allowed him to show in Paris for the first time in Spring Summer 2020. But regardless of this extreme success and media attention, Telfar still wanted the bag to be accessible to everyone. To combat the issue that the bags would sell out before everyone could buy one, the brand launched a pre-ordering system named the Bag Security Program in 2020, where customers could order before manufacturing was complete, so long as they were happy to wait six months for delivery. This was so successful that on launch it made $20 million. The bag is still extremely popular to this day, and despite so many people having the bag, it's still seen as a desirable product. He's launched a few more bags since then at a higher quality, but has done so without losing the experimental vision of fashion as an experience that the brand became known for, most notably with Telfar TV, which was launched in September 2020 as an online space to allow everyone to engage with the brand. 
You can even upload your own videos to Telfar.tv and stream it on multiple platforms. Also in 2020, he designed the Liberian Olympics team's costumes and he had an UGG collab in 2021 which was also extremely successful, featuring clothing, shoes and the infamous Telfar shopping bag made in the UGG sheepskin fabric. By 2020, Telfar had both the funding and the influence to put on four catwalk shows when he is inspired to do so so self-funded on a calendar that best suited his creative process. Meaning that he didn't show collections for spring, summer, or autumn, winter 21, but he did show in autumn, winter 2022. The budget is extreme, the clothes are incredible, and the idea is spectacular. Going off of the Telfar TV concept, the show was a combination between a fashion show and public access TV that read like a 90 minute long immersive performance art presentation. The show was split into two parts, the first of which an ode to athletic wear and the second half an ode to denim, both referencing fabrics he's been known to use in his long career, as well as deconstruction and genderless brand identifiers that his brand is also famed for. This collection debuted a couple of new bags, the most viral of which, the Circle Bag, I actually really like, and I think the quality is a great step up from the shopping bags that were really only ever designed as a prop. I know that vegan leather isn't the most durable, but the bag was never actually designed to be durable, so it's good to see a new bag that is more functional in that way, along with his Eastpac collaboration that was released this year too as a more hard-wearing bag offering. His journey from 2020 to now really validates how good it is for designers to have genuine creative freedom, but it's also a necessity to have the money to do so. I suppose that's why they announced a Telfar store to be opening this year, which we saw in the form of Telfar Rainbow, which was a one day pop up in Brooklyn. I personally was expecting something much bigger than this, but perhaps this is just a trial run for seeing how a retail store for Telfar would actually go in the future. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like to see more like this, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell below or check out some videos that are already available on my channel. 